Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we are based in the UK and the clocks changed last week on Sunday, all times are in BST. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 31st of March to the 6th of April. I'm Features Editor Ezzy Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Mary McIntyre. Hello, Mary. Hi, Ezzy. So, what do we have to look forward to in this week's night sky? Lots going on this week. We've got loads of lunar conjunctions and clear obscure effects to spot. We've got a couple of minor planets to spot. The moon's going to visit a beehive, and this week's big event is seven sisters hiding behind the moon. Very excited about that one. Oh, I'm very excited to hear about that one as well. So shall we get started with everything coming up this week? So I'm going to start with the planets again. Uranus is still in Taurus, as it was last week, near to the boundary of Aries. It moves very, very slowly, so it hasn't changed its position too much. It's very far away. <laughs> it takes some time to get anywhere. It really is, yeah. So that is setting around 11.30pm. You will need binoculars or a telescope to see that. It's mag plus 5.8, so it is just too faint for most people to see without optical aids. Jupiter is still in Taurus, and that is setting at 1.30am. That is still quite bright at mag minus 2.1, so that will be very obvious to spot. Be like the brightest star that you can see in the sky. On Wednesday, the 2nd of April, the crescent moon is going to be less than five degrees from Jupiter. So look out for that one. So Sunday, the 6th of April at 12.35 a.m., Europa is going to leave Jupiter's disk. To actually see the Galilean moons on the disk of Jupiter needs a really big telescope. So essentially, if you've got small telescope or strong binoculars, you basically just can't see the Galilean moon. But when it leaves the disk, you will start to see suddenly that it appears again. So that'll be good to look for. And if you do have a big telescope, then maybe you'll be able to spot it if you take some photographs. At 12.45 a.m., Ganymede is going to disappear behind the disk of Jupiter. So again, this kind of cat and mouse thing going on like we had last week. Looking at Mars, that is in Gemini this week. That is very high at 60 degrees above the southern sky after sunset, and it stays visible till 4.25 a.m. So it is fading and shrinking, but it is still mag plus 0.4, which is still decently bright, and it basically is pretty obvious. It's got that really red colour, so it kind of looks like a red star, essentially, but it, yeah, it's really pretty. On Saturday the 5th of April, the gibbous moon is going to be just 1.5 degrees away from Mars. So that's a really close conjunction. So that'll be great to seek out. Venus was an inferior conjunction on the 23rd of March. So it's now moved into the dawn sky. It lies in Pisces and is rising about 70 minutes before the sun. So although technically mag minus 4.4 in all of that twilight so low in the sky, it's going to be more difficult to see than you might expect. Yeah, just be careful if you are looking for it with binoculars. Make sure you know exactly where the sun will rise. Make sure that you've got a building blocking that part of the sky so there's no chance of any accidents. It's quite far away from the sun, kind of in terms of distance now, sideways, but just be really careful with that one. But you may spot it before sunrise if you're looking in Pisces. Mercury, Saturn and Neptune are all in Pisces this week, but too close to the sun to observe. The minor planet Vesta is in Libra and that is heading towards opposition on the 2nd of May. So it's rising about 11pm and is visible all night. It's around mag plus 5.97, so you will need optical aids to see that. And midweek, it's going to be three and a half degrees above Zubaneshamali. So it's a little bit further away from Zubaneshamali than it was last week. So it's kind of slowly drifting upwards. So it's really good to just see how it's changed its position since we observed it last week. So these asteroids and minor planets are always fun to just plot their movement against the background stars. Minor planet Flora was opposition on the 12th of March, and that is still really well placed in Leo. It's going to be around mag plus 10, so you're going to need optical aid for that, probably a telescope rather than binoculars. 
but it's heading towards the Leo Tripler. This is going to be a really exciting event coming up. So make sure that you're familiarizing yourself with where Flora is and keep tracking its movements because we've got some cool stuff coming up. Moving on to the moon, the moon this week is changing from a waxing crescent to a waxing gibbous with first quarter on Saturday. So this is the time where there are tons and tons of clear obscure effects to look for. But before that, on Tuesday, the 1st of April, the crescent moon is going to occult the stars of the Pleiades. The moon has been tantalizingly close to the Pleiades several times over the last few months. But from here in the UK, there haven't been any occultations of the whole cluster. That's going to happen this week. And I am really excited about it because conditions are really favorable M45 is still really high in the sky. We're around 30 degrees, which is pretty decent altitude when it gets dark. But the moon is a a crescent. So the glare of the moon is not going to overwhelm the cluster like it does when you've got a gibbous or a full moon. Mm. So the stars are actually going to disappear one by one behind the non-illuminated side of the moon. And if you do a long exposure picture and pick up Earthshine, you will see the moon's disk. But if you're just observing it visually, the stars will just start to disappear behind the non-illuminated part of the moon. So it all begins at quarter to 11 at night. Electra is the first one to get occulted, followed at 11 p.m. by Solano, then 11.23 Miro. 11.45 11.45 Alcyone and then Pleione is at 12.23 so really soon after that Atlas at 12.24 so there's lots and lots of different timestamps where all these stars are disappearing and then reappearing again from behind the illuminated part of the moon. So I love lunar occultations because it gives you that real sense of how the moon is moving at a different speed to the background stars and yeah it's just so lucky that this is happening at a time when it's all above the horizon, the good, decent altitude for the cluster and the moon is at a phase that is really favourable to observe this, even just with binoculars. So I really hope we get a clear sky for that because yeah. it's super exciting. That sounds really cool, to be honest. It's just this very famous site just slowly disappearing as the moon blocks it out of view. Because we have over like the last couple of years, even of the Star Diary podcast, if you go back through the episodes, every sort of month, the moon was getting closer and closer and closer to the Pleiades. And we sort of like, oh, it's starting to occult one star now. And now we're finally at that point where it's going right through the heart of it. So that's exciting to see. Yeah, just check again, the exact times of the occultations will vary depending on where you are. So just make sure that you do download Stellarium, set your location Mm -hmm. correctly, then you can actually check yourself what time exactly that all this happens. I will be out there from 10 just taking pictures and hoping to capture all of this. I know, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing what people do with that like the pictures maybe people making videos of you can see the moon slowly sliding across maybe somebody trying to get a picture where you can see not just the Pleiades but also the earth shine as well that could be really cool I don't know if that's doable but It'll be really interesting to see. And as always, if people are out there and listening and do manage to capture any picture of this occultation or anything else that we talk about on the Star Diary podcast, please do send us in your astro photos. We print the best in the magazine every month and sometimes we put them up on our website as well. Whether you're a beginner or you're a seasoned pro, please do send them in. The details of how to do that are in the show notes below. We absolutely love seeing those pictures, so please do send them in. On Saturday, the 5th of April at 1 p.m., we have a daytime lunar X and V visible. We've talked about this many times over the last couple of years. It's it's most people's favorite clear obscure effect because it's kind of easy to see even with binoculars. But a little while after that, at just before 9 p.m., we have the face in Albategnius where the lighting angle on the side of the crater means that the shadow that is cast has the side profile of a face. You do need to have a telescope to see that, though, because that's a fairly small crater compared to others. And in photographs, you should see that side profile. A bit later again, at 10.40 p.m., we've got Nessie in Ptolemaeus. So again, this is just where the shadow being cast by the wall of the crater is giving the impression of the Loch Ness Monster. It's just kind of this really weird kind of Nessie head that pokes up and... It's all just due to lighting angles and the way that the edges of the craters are not perfectly smooth and even, and it does create some really interesting shadows. 
On Sunday, the 6th of April at 3 a.m., we've got the stars of Aristillus Claire Obscure effect. This is gorgeous. As the sun rises over crater Aristillus, it's got quite a complex central peak system. And the sun just catches the tips of all of the central peak mountains. So you've got a partially shadowed crater with all of these dots in the centre. So it looks really nice. So that is a very time critical one because once the sun rises, obviously you can see the rest of the central peaks. But 3 a.m. is the time to look for that. Another intriguing one later that night on Sunday the 6th at 11.40 p.m. is Plato's Hook. And again, this is another strange one where the shadow cast from the crater wall is creating this kind of hook-shaped shadow. And I don't think anybody has definitively come up with an explanation as to why, because most of the shadows being cast are kind of straight, but this one isn't. So that's quite an intriguing one to look for as well. You think people know so much about the surface of the moon these days that we'd be able to work that sort of thing out. But most of our knowledge of the moon is taken from an orbiter looking straight down at it. And so the actual kind of topography of like how things rise and fall isn't always known. So, yeah, it's interesting that there's still things like that that are still puzzling us about on the moon. Yeah, and there there are literally hundreds of these sorts of clear obscure (laughs) effects. On the 7th of April at 2am, so later that Sunday night, technically on the Monday morning, we've got the eyes of Clavius visible during the early hours of the morning. And also on Sunday, the 6th of April, the moon is going to be just 2.3 degrees away from the Beehive Cluster, Messier 44. One other thing to look for, the Summer Milky Way is now just starting to give us a tantalising glimpse if you're in a really early start, if you're up very, very early. If you, when the moon is out of the way in the first half of the week, just have a look to the southeastern sky at around 4am. You can see the top of Sagittarius, part of the teapot asterism, and you will actually see part of the bit of the Milky Way that is closer to the galactic core. The bit around Cygnus is now getting quite high as well. That that's popping up on our meteor camera time lapses quite nicely. But just before dawn, we're starting to see that bit around Sagittarius, which is so colourful and pretty. That will, of course, get higher as the, the weeks go on. But it's really nice to kind of see the glimpse of the summer Milky Way now as well. And finally, as we're in kind of April showers season, have a look for rainbows. April and May seem to be a really good time for seeing rainbows, which are not as frequently seen as people might think they are. They're always on the opposite side of the sky from where the sun is. So when you've got sunshine and showers, if the sun comes out and it's raining, have a look on the opposite side of the sky and you may see a fragment or a whole rainbow. When we get later into the summer, if the sun is too high, you can't see a rainbow. I think we talked about this last year, but the way that the sunlight gets deflected by the raindrops it's always 42 degrees or thereabouts so if the sun is higher than 42 degrees and you're at ground level the rainbow is below the horizon for you so at this time of year the sun is only just tipping above that around noon so basically it's up for grabs any time of day that it's raining and you've got sunshine there's a chance that you may get fragments of rainbows the later in the day it is the higher the rainbow will be the nearer to noon the lower the rainbow will be The rainbow itself is always a circle, but it's how much of it that we see that changes depending on the height of the sun. So do keep an eye out for that. I always seem to see loads of them at this time of year and then nothing for for months afterwards. So, yeah, make sure that you're looking out for that. Well, thank you, Mary. I'll definitely be on the lookout for rainbows going out through the month. It's one of those classic things and it does actually work. It's like, oh, it's raining, but at least you get to see a rainbow. That's always nice. We'll be back next week with even more stargazing highlights, so please do subscribe to the podcast. But to summarise this week again. On Monday the 30th of April, we seek out the minor planet Flora in Leo this week because next week it features in a very special event, so check back in for that one. On Tuesday the 1st of April, from 10.45pm, there is a lunar occultation of the Pleiades. On Wednesday the 2nd of April, the moon lies less than 5 degrees from Jupiter. On Thursday the 3rd of April, Vesta lies 3.5 degrees from Zubin el Shamili. On Friday the 4th of April, catch a glimpse of the summer Milky Way above the southeastern horizon before dawn breaks. On the 5th of April, the moon lies 1.5 degrees from Mars, and it's a great time to look for the lunar X and V, as well as several other clairobscure effects. On Sunday the 6th of April at 3am, the star of Aristillus clairobscure effect is also visible. Then later that evening, Plato's hook also comes into view. 
And it's April shower season, so do keep an eye out for any rainbows that you might see in the sky as well during the day. From all of us here at Star Diary, goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Mm-hmm.